So uh, I also want to actually do something we haven't really done before, and that is welcome people who are watching us on YouTube Live right now. So um, when you're traveling, yeah, exactly. So uh, I have Ralph and Cindy, welcome wherever you are. I happen to know some people who uh, aren't able to be here because of uh, someone's health, and I said, hey, watch this this morning. So when you're traveling, you can go to YouTube and look up uh, New Community Church on YouTube, and you'll be able to watch that live uh, at the 11 o'clock service. So we're really glad to be able to debut that today. So let's pray together. Lord, I am asking you to do something special here today, and you've already done that, did it at the nine, and we pray you do it again. Teach us something that we will never forget. We are expectant, and God, you can meet, and more than that, you can exceed, far exceed our expectations. So do something here in our hearts today, we pray in Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Please grab a seat, and now we're going to ask you if you want to grab a Bible, because we have these uh, Bibles we're handing out. The ushers have them. If you'd like to follow along, raise your hand, and they will get you one. So raise a hand, and they will give you a Bible so you can follow along. I think on our first slide here, we tell you what page to look at. Thank you, Bill. Yes, page 1209 is where we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 8. So get one of those. And if you don't have a Bible to take you know, at home, please feel free to take that home. So that is our gift to you. So, I am going to make what uh, to me seemed like a pretty complicated passage, hopefully very simple and accessible, and that is, of course, the hard work of, uh, of speaking on Hebrews. It doesn't always yield to an easy study. And the passage that we are looking in today is kind of interesting because it begins with a summary statement, and I want you to take a look at it. Here it is. Look at what the writer says. Now, the main point of what we're saying is this, right? So he's saying, here it is. Here's the main point. He says, and here's that main point, we do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. So what we're going to see here is, of course, what's the main point? That we have this high priest. We're, we're going to work that out today, which means one thing, Jesus is our intermediary, and so guess what we don't need anymore? Go ahead and put it up. We don't need religion. It's the end of religion is what this is saying. So religion's over. And that's what we're going to see here today. Because Jesus did not come to bring a new religion. He came to open up a relationship with God that he, the high priest, was going to open to us. And we're going to see that because priests all through history, they were intermediaries. And Jesus said, you don't need one anymore because I've gone in and you can know me and have direct access to the Father. And so you don't have a religion. What do you have? Exactly, you got it? Okay, you guys know this message. Why don't you preach it? We'll just go from there. Now, I want you to be asking yourself a question all day today through this uh, message, and that is this simple question. Am I practicing a religion, or do I have a relationship with God? I want you to ask that question of yourself today. Am I practicing a religion, or do I have a relationship with God? So let's begin by defining this word religion, and I'll go ahead and put up a simple definition. A religion is a set of rituals, ceremonies designed to bridge the gap between me and God. So religion is all about making a deal with the deity, okay? It's like making a contract with God. And the main question we ask God when we think that the way to him is religion is this one. What do I have to do to gain your favor? And every religion then prescribes what you have to do to bridge that gap. And in most of them, it's a, a gap between us and a, maybe a God who's very far off. And some, it's a God who's within, and we'll see that. But it's all about bridging that gap. What practices do I have to do? What rites? What ceremonies? What denials? What, what um, different things, oblations, you know, and washings and cleansing? What do I have to do to bridge that gap between me and God, whoever he is? Now, I think it'll be helpful for us to kind of do a catalog of the different religions. And so let's look at how the different religions view how we bridge that gap through religion to get from us to God. Let's begin with Islam. Islam has the five tenets, and they are listed in the left there. First of all, profession of faith, and that is that there is no God but God, and Muhammad is the messenger of God. Secondly, prayer, which you probably know of, five times a day facing Mecca. And then almsgiving, which is giving a fixed portion of your money to the poor. And then fasting, which is during Ramadan, you fast from food and drink during the daylight hours of Ramadan. 
and then a pilgrimage, um, which is a visit to the holy city of Mecca once in your lifetime if you have the financial means. So that is the five tenets of Islam. Judaism, let's put that one up, is the belief in the one true God, so it's very monotheistic, of course, that you obey the commandments and that you practice the rituals of holy days and Sabbath. And, of course, Christianity came out of this. Now, New Age is kind of different because New Age sees not God outside of us, but God what? God inside of us, God within. And so the difference here is that God is not the other. God is within you. And to bridge the gap within, because New Age wouldn't say, you know, you just have this natural connection. You have to do things to kind of understand your own deity and connect with your own kind of value. And so you meditate or you use any of a variety of psychic techniques designed to bring you to an altered consciousness and awareness of your own divinity. So that's New Age. We move on then to Hinduism. And the point of Hinduism is to free oneself from that cycle, the law of karma, and to break out of the cycle of endless reincarnation. And the way you do that is you're devoted to any of the Hindu deities, and there might be thousands or tens of thousands of Hindu deities. You grow in knowledge through meditation on oneness, sometimes called the Om, you know, the one, the one great, um, the great one that is at the center of the universe, and dedicate oneself to certain religious ceremonies. So that's Hinduism. And then finally, Buddhism, which would say you seek spiritual enlightenment through detachment from desire and detachment from the self, which is why the Buddha is quiet and, you know, has that smile because he's detaching himself from any desire. Now, let's take a look and just do a quick summary of these different religions and their view of God, the deity. So in Hinduism, there's multitudes of gods. In Buddhism, there is no god or no need for god. New Age, I am god. Islam, god is powerful but ultimately not knowable. In Christianity, very different. God is a loving being who created us to know him. Now, when you see this, can you see the folly of saying that all the religions are equally true? Because they're so radically different. So how would a person say, well, you know, they're all true. They, they absolutely oppose each other. But here's why I think people can say that they're all equally true or valid. First of all, they don't know what they say. They don't understand the religions. And secondly, what they do is they skim the surface so superficially that they say, well, I'm kind of Buddhist because I'm a spiritual person and I like to meditate. But they really haven't embraced what is true Buddhism. And that's why they can say that all the religions are the same in an equal way to to get to God. Now, all that is, is not to say that there's nothing in common with all of the world religions. And as a matter of fact, uh, I always have liked what C.S. Lewis said about this. And let me just read him um, a quote from his. He said, if you are a Christian, you do not have to believe that all the other religions are simply wrong all through. If you are an atheist, you do have to believe that the main point in all religions of the whole world is simply one huge mistake. If you're a Christian, you are free to think that all these religions, even the queerest ones, contain at least some hint of the truth. When I was an atheist, I had to try to persuade myself that most of the human race have always been wrong about the question that mattered to them most. But when I became a Christian, I was able to take a more liberal view. But of course, being a Christian does mean that thinking that where Christianity differs from other religions, Christianity is right and they are wrong. As in arithmetic, there is only one right answer to a sum, and all the other answers are wrong. But some of the wrong answers are much nearer being right than others. Interesting, right? So let me center us again on religion. It's a set of rituals or ceremonies designed to bridge the gap between me and God. And the question for the day, I'll put it up again, am I, are you practicing a religion, or do you have a relationship with God? So if religion is making a deal with God, Here's how you know that you're practicing religion. I want you to do a little self-diagnosis here today. You do certain things to try to get God to do certain things for you. You know, you've made a deal with him, and you expect that if you keep your end of the bargain, well, you expect him to keep his end of the bargain. So you might say, well, God, I'm going to go to church or temple or mosque. So I kind of don't expect that you're going to let one of my family members have a terrible accident or get sick. Uh, You might say, uh, God, I'm doing daily prayers or some kind of daily ritual, so don't let any serious loss hit me or my family. And what I want to say here is there's a very simple and clear test that you can put to yourself to determine whether you are viewing this as a religion or a relationship. And here's what I call the simple test. 
when something bad happens to me or something good doesn't happen to me that I want, I get angry with God. That's the religious test. If you get mad at God when something bad happens, what did you have? You had to deal with him. You had to deal with him where you said, hey, I've been kind of keeping my uh, P's and Q's. I've been, you know, going to church. I've been praying. I've been giving. I've been doing all this stuff. And you let this happen to me? Now, haven't we all heard that? Haven't we all actually said that? Amen. We say that. And this is, all, this is in all of us. And so, you know, you think he should kind of keep his end of the deal here. And let me tell you, this is why I think so many people walk away from God these days. You know, you see all these uh, deconversion stories. You know, you see that in the news and so on. You know, I think it is. They haven't embraced the real relationship with God, but they've embraced enough of Christianity to view it as a religion. And when God doesn't do what they thought he should have done, they walk away. And in many of those stories, you see that's true. Something bad happens. They go, I didn't think this could happen to me. And you say, well, you had a religion. You didn't have a relationship. You had misunderstood the core of Christianity. And I think that happens all the time. Now, you might be saying, where does it say this in the book of Hebrews, in the passage we're studying today, that Jesus is the end of religion? Well, it's where the writer compares the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. And if you're following along now, look at Hebrews 8, verses 6 through 13. And again, we're on page 1207 in the Bibles we handed out. So I'll be beginning in verse 6. And the writer says this. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said... The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Because they did not remain faithful to my covenant and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. Now what is that? That's religion. That was a religious deal. God made a covenant with the people of Israel. I'm going to deliver you from the land of Egypt. You're going to do certain things. If you don't, you're going to lose this. That was religion. It's a deal. And many of, of the many purposes that the Old Testament uh, served, one of them would say, you can't keep deals with God. You can't keep deals with God. You just don't have it in you. You have this brokenness in you that doesn't allow you to keep it. You're going to need something else. It's called grace and it's called Jesus Christ, but we're going to talk about that later. So here's what it says now as we continue in verse 10 of uh, Hebrews 8. He says, this is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. So religion, friends, has been replaced with a new covenant in which God forgives our wickedness and remembers our sins no more. Religion has been replaced with relationship because the high priest that every high priest that every priest or high priest ever pointed to has gone into the real temple with the real sacrifice and said it's finished, it's done, and I have paid the price. And that is why we have a relationship with Jesus, the true high priest, not a religion that requires a bunch of high priests to do something that really is just looking forward to Jesus. Now, Let me lay this out in a way that I think is going to be helpful and make it even clearer. And I had a couple people ask me after the first service if we would print this. A couple people took pictures of it. I'm going to print it and have it in your bulletin next week. Tammy, can you make sure we get that done? So, thank you, Tammy. (laughs) I guess that's a yes. (laughs) Okay, so take a look at this. Here's the difference. Religion, what I do. Relationship, what Jesus did. Religion, hope for my sufficiency relationship, trust, the sufficiency, not of me, but of Christ. He's fully sufficient. Religion's all about measuring up, right? And relationship is, I fall short, but that's the door to seeking forgiveness, because I realize I measure up. Religion, I'm proud if I do well. Relationship, I'm humble, because it's never about doing anyway. Religion, I'm proud if I do well. I'm ashamed if I do poorly, but in relationship, I'm just grateful, because I'm his, and he has taken care of it all. In religion, the way in is my acts. In relationship, the way in is surrender to the love of God in Jesus. And in religion, you need a priest. You need to go between. In a relationship, you've got a priest, Jesus, and he walks with you and he talks with you every day. Amen? That is the difference between religion and relationship, friends. 
And I'm going to ask you again, are you in a religion or are you in a relationship? Now, here's another way to see this. What is a priest? A priest is a person who mediates between us and God. And uh, they may bring your offering to the deity, but they represent you to God. And on a human level, in the Old Covenant, the priest would do what? He'd bring the offerings of the people to God. Now, what did that symbolize that those offer, offerings were being brought? The animals were bring, being brought because there was a problem. Something had to die, right? Something had to suffer because of this problem called sin that we have. And so the priest was saying, we have a problem. We're going to bring an animal and sacrifice that animal and let them pay a price so you don't have to pay a price. That's what the high priest was doing. So it tells us the important principle that sin requires a price to be paid. Now, let me just help you flesh this out a little bit more. Everybody knows what a reenactment is, right? A reenactment is when you, let me just you know, define this in technical terms. It's when you re-enact something. <laughs> you enact it re in a new way. Okay, so like Civil War reenactment, if you ever see a reenactment, it's like they're act reenacting what happened in the Civil War. Okay, now here's something that I think may be very helpful for you. All the sacrifices of the Old Testament were something else. You know what they were? They were a pre-enactment. They were portrayals of what was going to happen in the future. They weren't the real thing. They pre-enacted when the true priest was going to the true temple and the true heaven and the true you know, place where the what dwelling of God is, and he would bring the final sacrifice. They were all pre-enactments of what was going to happen when Jesus entered the holy place that we're reading about here in Hebrews 8. Now, again, look at the opening verses of our chapter, and you see this. Let's go ahead and put it up. Now, the main point of what we're saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary. The true tabernacle, so it's a sanctuary, it's a true tabernacle, and it's set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being like all those pre-enactments. This is the real thing. So Jesus went into the true sanctuary, the true tabernacle, the true place of God's dwelling, and he brings the sacrifice, the true sacrifice to God the Father. And what does he bring to offer? I hear you whispering, you got it exactly right. He brings himself. And so every single Old Testament sacrifice was a pre-enactment of the day when Jesus would say, Father, here's the offering, the true offering for the sins of the people. Now here's a question. You notice, if you keep that verse up, What's the first thing he did? We do have such a high priest. What's the first thing he does? You guys are being a little timid today. You got it right. He sits down. Now, when do we sit down? Well, let me just talk about that a little bit. Anybody else do their leaves yesterday? Okay. I did my leaves yesterday. You know, I have, I have about an acre and a half in Ingemar, so I, and I have a lot of trees, so I have a lot of leaves, right? But fortunately, I have a bagging, uh, you know, riding mower, so... I can just, you know, mostly just bag them. But, you know, that's, it's still a lot of work. I probably spent the whole afternoon, you know, mowing and blowing and tarping and, you know, moving all these leaves. And after I was done, you know, you know what I did? I sat down. That's exactly what I did. But I don't just sit down. I go to my wife. I go, hey. As a matter of fact, I said, this is going to be so good. I want to have some people over and have a little bonfire so I can go to them. Hey. Look at that yard. And I did that. I walked my, hey, let's go into the backyard. You see how big it was? No leaves there. You know, I'm picking them up by hand in the front yard, one on one. You know, I do that. I do that. But you know what's funny? You believe it. Because um, you know me. You know I would do that. And I actually do. So what does Jesus do when he gets into the tabernacle of God? He sits down. And what's the sign of? Guess what he's done with? He's done with his work. He's done working. As far as God is concerned, the work that's required to get into God's holy presence is finished when Jesus comes into the presence of the Father on high and sits down at his right hand. He said, it's done. And what are the words? What are the last words of Jesus on the cross? What does he say? It is? All right, the work is done. It is finished. That's exactly right. So is there any work left for you and me to do before God to get into his presence? That's exactly right, because the work has been done. There is no more room for religion doing stuff to get onto God's good side. Amen? There is only the opportunity for relationship. And that relationship starts when you lay aside all self-trust and put your trust in what God says he has done through his son Jesus Christ and says, you can have a perfect, loving relationship with me forever, and it's not based on anything you do. It's based on everything he's done, and you can have it. Just take it. It's yours. And my question to you, as I 
say I'm asking you questions today is, have you done that? Have you trusted what God has said, and is Jesus your go-between, that, and you know now no religion is needed between you and God? Have you faced the fact that if it was just you and not Jesus, that you would be forever irreparably ineligible to enter God's presence because of sin? Have you embraced that Jesus is the one who paid your sin and allowed you to come into his presence boldly and say, God, I can stand before you because Jesus got on the cross before you and died for me. And do you love him for what he's done for you? Do you love him? Now, you know what love is. Let me ask you a question. Is love a religion word or a relationship word? It's a relationship word. And it's where you say, you know, Jesus died for me. He carried my name into the presence of God. And he says, God the Father, Mark's sins were laid on me, and they are paid in full. He has no work left to do. Now, I said, you know when you are counting on religion, when you get mad when bad things happen? Here's how you know you're in a relationship with God. You're so grateful for his love for you that you would do anything for him. And the Bible word for that, and I bet you aren't going to guess what it is, it's the word repentance. Because you say, God, I've been going my own way my whole life, and I've been doing what's important to me, and now because you've loved me so and done so much for me, I'm going to start asking, what can I do for you? That's repentance, where you turn around and say, I'm going to live for you. Christians live differently because they love God and they want to bring him pleasure. So which one is it for you? Let's look at it again. Is it religion? What can I do to bridge the gap? Or is it relationship? I have been loved so beautifully by God. How can I return this kind of love? And friends, this is a communion Sunday, so this is a perfect day for you to throw off dead religion and embrace that relationship. If you haven't done it or if it's grown cold. Because... That's exactly what communion is all about. We talked about reenactments and pre-enactments. What's communion? It's a reenactment, isn't it? A reenactment of the reason that the price has been paid. So we're going to reenact that act in history as we take these symbols of the body and blood of Christ. And when we're going we're to say, I have a seat at the table of God because of Jesus. And we're going to do this in a little bit of a different way today. We're going to take these signs. But I want to give you a moment to respond to God, if God's been talking to you. Last night, you know, I was finishing up this message and... I felt God was saying to me, Mark, I have something special for some people in this room tomorrow. And I believe that, and I prayed. And I got on my knees and said, God, do something special in this place today, as I prayed this morning. And what I want to give you a chance to do is, in a few moments, we're going to take communion. We're going to distribute communion. But before we do that, we're going to just take some time, and everybody's going to bow their heads, and we're just going to pray. And if you've been viewing God as a relationship, I'm sorry, as a religion, where it's what you do, I'm going to ask you, as everybody's heads are just bowed. I'm gonna, you see these crosses over here? I want you to bring that dead religion to God and leave it there. Do you understand what I'm saying? You go over those crosses, kneel for a few moments as the music's playing, and as people's heads are bowed, they're not looking at you, and you just go over and say, God, I've been viewing it as a religion of what I do, and I'm going to give it up, and I just want that relationship. You see what I'm saying? And then when I sense you're done at those rails, those of you who need to go over there, then we're going to move on with the whole thing of communion. But Marianne, would you, pr- would you play, and I'm going to pray. God, I've asked you to do a special thing because some of us here today view you through the eyes of religion. What can I do? I have to keep doing it. Am I doing enough? Do I measure up? And we want to lay that dead religion at the cross today. So God, as people respond to you and prepare to take the symbols and say, it's a free relationship, God, radical and gracious. We come and we receive your love and then we return your love. So now as we just... Pray silently, friends, as she plays. If you want to give up some religion, either it was complete for you or there was just a vestige of it kind of resurfacing, make your way to those crosses and do some business with God before we take communion. We'll give you a few moments to do that. Come to the cross and say, no more religion for me, God. I receive your love. I trust that you've done it all for me and I will live for you from this day forward.
All right, friends, now if you would pray this prayer of confession with me. We're going to move through it slowly. We're going to just stay with that slide until I tell you for the next one, Bill. Let's pray this together. Lord Jesus, I have sinned times without number and been guilty of pride and unbelief and of neglect to seek you in my daily life. So just let that stay with you for a second. Maybe you want to, in your heart, name one of those sins or those sins that are on your shoulders today. Let's move on. My sins and shortcomings present me with a list of accusations, but I thank you that they will not stand against me, for all have been laid on Christ. Let's say that last phrase beginning with but. But I thank you that they will not stand against me, for all have been laid on Christ. Next part, please. Deliver me from every evil habit, every interest of former sins, everything that dims the brightness of your grace in me, everything that prevents you, me taking delight in you. Amen.